Man has worshipped creation, the work of his own hands, and the work of God even. And it's wonderful to recognize God is the maker of all these things and to marvel upon his handiwork. But to turn and to worship creation rather than the creator is a gross sin. But instead of immediately pouring out judgment on man as we deserved, God sent forth a redeemer to purchase us, to deliver us from death to life. But not only does he send a redeemer, but he blesses us by making us to be participants in the ministry of redemption to the world. In Revelation chapter 1, we discover that this mighty God who has taken on our flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, is walking among these lampstands. And the lampstands are the seven churches of God. We are the lampstands bringing light to the nations. But there's a warning that follows in chapter 2. Don't take this honor lightly. It is not automatic that you will have it, but rather you are called to be faithful. If I have given you my spirit, if I have delivered you, if you really are my witnesses in the world, you will be transformed. You will hate sin more and more, and you will grow in grace. If you do not take this seriously, I will remove your lampstand. You will no longer be light to the nations. So while many in the church think, I've played the sinner's prayer, I read my Bible all as well. No, there was a calling for the church community to be faithful or lose their status. So there is a cost we discover as we read the rest of chapters 2 and 3. Christians are being persecuted. There is division within the church and some good men are being thrown out of the church. But there is persecution coming from outside and Faithful members of the church are being killed. And Jesus tells us not, it's no big deal. Nor does he tell us, it's all in your mind, it'll go away. He says, you are going to suffer. I'm going to send tribulation on you. But persevere. If you stay true to me, you will remain a light to the nations and you will be the conqueror who overcomes not in the ways of the world. The world thinks you only overcome when you destroy your enemy. But you see, the world is unable to know what goes on in heaven and what shall be for all eternity. So I'm announcing to you, your faithful perseverance will make you an overcomer. And I will keep you as a light to the nations and a blessing to many. Only I ask of you this. Believe, trust in me, persevere. And then we are given a vision of heaven. We discover that God is already seated on his throne. We discover that Christ, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, is also the sacrificial lamb, and he rules over all. He is given the scroll. He gets to open up and discover what is the will of his father. He executes the will of his father on earth. In the first four seals that were broken, we read about our current history and about all the ages, that there is suffering and death because this is a world in sinful rebellion against God and that this death comes into the church. There is no magic formula that rescues us from the dangers that are out there. Rather, we are given knowledge and we are given the Spirit of God so that we may persevere through the four horsemen who have come to bring judgment on a sinful world. Believe it or not, your being here today is testimony of God's promise being true. You have already begun your overcoming. Now we come to the fifth seal. And here in the fifth seal, we discover what has happened to our brothers. They visibly can now see the Lord reigns. They have died and they have been translated out of this life of suffering to glory. They are able to see God sitting on his throne and the Lamb of God. They are also very painfully aware 
of the sinful nature of the world they left behind. They may not have all been murdered, but they were hated by the world. They were persecuted, they were mocked, and people sought to tempt them and turn them from righteousness to death. And they heeded the warning from the loyal king to persevere and to overcome, in spite of all the temptations to give in and to compromise to every sort of sin. So God has brought redemption. God has brought blessing. We have received great gifts, and yet we want to listen to those who are bringing to us darkness and death. All men have this necessary decision to commit to serve one of two masters, the Lord God or Satan himself. By God's grace, by his spirit regenerating you, you have been made to serve and love the Lord God. And you have become a people who love God so much that you will set aside your own hatred of others, your own just claims against other people who have sinned against you, and you will pray for them to also receive this blessing so that voices will be added to the choir that praises God. You will be one who, no matter what occurs, perseveres in suffering. You see, then, the story of Job is revealing to us the condition of the faithful saints. Job is one who is faithful to the Lord, blameless and upright. He feared God, not man. He had received great and amazing blessing. We read of his riches being incredible. And Satan tells God, Job likes you for one reason and one reason only. He has material blessing from you. That's the only reason he worships you. Same excuse that's made about you guys. All you guys are Christians now because you haven't really suffered. You're, you just kind of go through this routine. You're hoping that the good luck streak you've had being in a rich country and having money will continue. Whatever the talisman is, whatever the gift you need to give, you'll give to God so that you maintain your current riches and wealth. And God said, Satan, do with Job what you want. Take his property. It's all in your hands. You want to know if my servant Job is faithful? God sets Job out there to bring honor to his name. See, we often make the mistake of thinking this is a test for Job. It's not. It is God knowingly putting his servant out there to glorify himself as Satan seeks to destroy him. So Satan does. He destroys all of Job's wealth and kills his ten children. And Job's response is recorded for us in verse 20. He is sorrowful. I'm guessing that had he only lost his wealth, he would have been a bit sorrowful about that. But he's lost his children. And he arose, tore his robes, shaved his head, fell on the ground, and worshipped God. And he acknowledged this. Nothing he ever had was really his own, but it all belonged to God. Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be blessed and honored. In all this, Job did not account it as bad luck, fate. He knew the good he had received was from God. He knew the tribulation he was undergoing was from God. But it was God who must be honored as God. And so he blessed God. And it's recorded for us in all this. He was righteous. He did not sin. Chapter 2 of Job records that Satan says, yeah, as long as he had his health, he would be okay. So God says, fine. Damage him in any way you can, except don't extinguish his life. And he is given such horrible pain, we read later, that he takes broken pottery to scrape off his skin. It hurts so bad. He looks deformed. He looks like he survived an explosion, or maybe looks like he didn't survive it. His friends are horrified when they see him. Think about this. Have you ever gone to visit somebody who's got a broken arm or you know is bleeding? You feel kind of bad, but 
you wait a minute or two, then you start trying to talk to them to try to change the subject. His friends sat with him for seven days before they opened their mouths. They were so horrified at what they saw had become to their friend. Satan had said, when he suffers this way, he will curse you, God, because he's not getting any blessing from you. He only liked you because of blessing, not because you are God, not because he recognized you as the king are to be worshipped. Even Job's wife becomes a tempter and says, curse God and die. And Job responds in verse 10 of chapter 2, Are you saying that you think God is like a good luck charm, that we should only receive good from God, but not trust him as our father, not trust him as king who has the right to rule, and that sometimes we must endure tribulation at his hand? God would not be cursed by the lips of his faithful servant, even in the midst of this horrible, horrible suffering. Instead, we see Psalm 13 recorded. These are not the words of Job, but these would have been the sentiment of Job. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul, talk to myself, rather than speak to you and hear from you? What you have here then is Job did not know what was going on. What were the battles being faced? Why God was putting him through that? You see, the church that was suffering, as John records the book of Revelation, in the same way, is unaware of what God is doing. And we are witnessing around us dissension and discord, people being upset with one another, marriages falling apart, children walking away from the faith, churches dividing, ministers becoming heretics, and death. Yes, we're in the United States. We don't get to see a lot of Christians being murdered for their faith. But we're beginning to sense there is a turning of the tide. People are being forced to act against conscience. But throughout the world, Christians are being murdered just because they are Christians. We need to understand then, like Job, God is king. We didn't become Christians for the health and wealth gospel, to name it and claim it. We're not here because God is a good luck charm. We're here because it's the truth. He is God. And he's allowed us to come before him through a mediator rather than directly in judgment. What we read when the fifth seal is broken is this reality, that Jesus Christ sovereignly ruled over the death of his servants. Remember, the scroll is given to the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God has the right to execute the will of God. He breaks open the seals, indicating he is bringing these things to pass. With the fifth seal being broken, we discover it is the will of God that Christians should suffer, but they should also persevere. So the suffering that has occurred was at the hand of God in the tribulation that was ordained for you. You were given a duty to continue to recognize God is the giver of every good gift and has the right to take away all things, and yet he is to be worshipped. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for their witness that they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before we get to see your majesty? How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Understand the nature of this prayer. As I said, we commit to serving one of two masters, and those who serve the merciful king now pray for their enemies to be delivered from death. You and I don't get to pray, Lord, how long before you judge your enemies? Because right now, we don't know who will ultimately be the final enemies of God. We pray, Lord, bless them, forgive them. They don't know what they do. The harm that they have caused us, don't hold it against them. Let their sin be washed away by the Lamb of God. The saints are saying, 
how long before you judge? Because in heaven, they are being given the privilege of knowing who are the final enemies of God. They're not praying for destruction against those who harm them on earth. Like Jesus, like Stephen, they prayed, Lord, don't hold it against them. But now in heaven, they're praying, Lord, vindicate the honor of your name with those whom you have chosen not to redeem. And it is the will of God that we do both. While here in these bodies, pray for those who persecute you. Pray that you may have a forgiving heart. Pray that you desire their good and pray that they receive blessing from God. In the last day, if God has not delivered them, then pray for the honor of God, that his holiness be vindicated in their judgment. Now, you are going to have to be like Job, in the midst of suffering, not blaming God, but praising him. And remember what Job did as he suffered in the world. What was his first reaction? To come before God with penitence and pray to God for his own glory. That goes to you too. I don't care if you're having a good day or a bad day. When worship is called, you come to worship God because this is where God once again blesses you with his spirit to strengthen you so that you don't fall away, as many do. And so, the saints of God pray the words of Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, before we shall see you vindicate your own honor and show to the world that we were actually your servants. The world hated us and persecuted us, but we did no evil. We even prayed for our enemies. Cons going back to Psalm 13, verse 3. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Let my en lest my enemy say, I have prevailed. Let I don't want the world to believe that you are weak and I can be conquered. Lord, be with me and strengthen me that the world may see your spirit is all-powerful and I can love them and let the transforming power of the gospel save the worst of men that others may see the Lord and glorify him. Lord, don't let the wicked rejoice in their strength. We're asking for mercy to be shown to them. But the psalmist knows, like Job, there is more than my immediate experience. There is something ultimate and greater that is not yet revealed to me. So by verse 5, he says, I have trusted in your steadfast, your covenant love. Though I suffer at the moment, I know my heart shall rejoice in the deliverance, salvation. And I will sing to the Lord. Because I affirm, in the midst of physical suffering, he has dealt bountifully with me by promising and giving me a redeemer. And so as the saints cry out to God in heaven, what does God tell them? Verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 11. They were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer because it was not yet time for God's final glory to be revealed until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were killed as they themselves had been. Hardly sounds like words of comfort coming to you, does it? I am promising to you, some among you will suffer and die for the name of the Lord. That part doesn't sound so good. But like the psalmist, you know that's temporary. We're all going to die. We're all going to leave this earthly temple. But some will be blessed. And so those who are in heaven, remember, they've suffered. I don't know if you've ever undergone some horrible suffering, but rarely do you want your friends to also undergo it. They're being told, actually, no, a lot of your brothers and sisters are going to undergo it. But for now, know this. Christ's righteousness has covered your sins. Wear the white robe that is appropriate for those who dwell in the throne room of the king. And now know this. You asked, how long 
before your name is vindicated? How long, O oh God, before you avenge the enemies who have hated your precious bride, the church? Verse 12. He breaks open the sixth seal. They get to witness the final judgment. Now, the four horsemen were the ordinary sufferings of this present age. The sixth seal is cosmic, and it occurs pretty early in the book. So in other words, this book of Revelation is not this long calendar that you can follow. It'll recycle. We're going to see the final judgment three times in the book of Revelation because the story is told over and over again from different perspectives. The saints who suffered will get to see the destruction of the enemies of God and man. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth. The moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. And every mountain and island was removed from its place. That's pretty permanent judgment. Then the kings of the earth, the great ones, the generals, the rich, the powerful, and everyone slave and free, who worship the creature rather than the creator, who made idols for themselves, now like Adam and Eve, flee and hide themselves. But they go one step further. They call on creation to shield them from God. But nothing will shield them from the wrath of God, which is coming upon the ungodly. They hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rock, fall on us and hide us from the face of the Lamb who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come, and who can stand? The day of rebellion will be brought to an end, and the day of wrath will come. And this fulfills, you see, the prophecies of Isaiah 24. Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate, and he will twist its surface, scatter its inhabitants, and it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, the slave with the master, the maid with the mistress, and it goes on in these pairs. By verse 5, the earth lies defiled under its inhabitants, for they have transgressed laws, violated the statutes, and broken the everlasting covenant. Righteousness is rewarded, sin is punished, the covenant of works. Therefore, the curse that comes upon lawbreakers devours the earth and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched and few men are left. God might be slow by our standards, but he comes ultimately to judge. And you see that God will vindicate his holiness and he will vindicate his servants. We will get to see one of two ends to our enemies. Our prayers will be answered and they will be made our brothers and sisters and the blood of Christ will wash away their sins and you're going to be given the Holy Spirit such that you will be happy about it. You will joy in the Lord and praise him for saving them. Or in the last day you will see them destroyed because God did not will to bring them to redemption. You will, in either case, be fully at peace with God and praise him. We will get to see this prophecy. And it is a terrible thing to know what is coming upon those who are not part of Christ's church. You can see Isaiah 34 and how much this is quoted here. All the host of heaven shall rot away. The skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine like leaves falling from the fig tree. John says this day of judgment is coming. And then, what's interesting, we read Isaiah 24, that the law of God being violated brought judgment. Many of you will recognize us today. Once again, we will read Isaiah 25, at the Lord's Supper. That day the Lord will remove the veil that covers the nations. He will take away t death and wipe every tear from their eyes. You see, judgment and final joy go together. So what we have then in Revelation is this knowledge. You have been saved, but don't think that that means health and wealth on earth. You may, like Job, receive great blessings on earth, 
But you may also, like Job, suffer the loss of everything, including your precious children and your own health, and be in excruciating pain and not be allowed to die. In all this, persevere. In persevering, you praise God. In these things, your prayers are lifted up to God and he hears you. Though you may not be aware of why he is doing this now. In all that suffering of Job, was it punishment for any sin? No. It was that Satan would be humiliated. The cost you bear for the Christian faith now your sacrificing the pleasures of this life to attend worship, your willingness to forego lust and adultery in order that you may be chaste and virtuous. These things are humiliating Satan who thinks he owns you, who puts temptations before you and thinks you're going to succumb to them, and you overcome by the grace of God. And he is more infuriated. By the end of the book of Job, it's recorded for us that of all the wealth he lost, everything was doubled. He received a more immediate material reward as an example to us. But there's one fascinating part. The number of his children is not doubled on earth. He lost ten children. At the end, he gets back ten children, which gives something very important for us. It means his ten children were still his he winds up, everything is doubled. The ten children remain in heaven, ten more are added to it. Through all that perseverance, there was reward greater he could ever imagine. And in that same way, John records for us what God would have us to know. Your suffering, your tribulations are ordained by God. They are executed by Christ. And it's because he has you as his virtuous champion on earth to humiliate Satan and the kingdom of darkness. You triumph and overcome every time instead of avoiding the troubles, you acknowledge them before God and pray to him that he would uphold you. When you pray for your enemies, when you worship God with thankful hearts in plenty or in days of famine and poverty, you acknowledge the words of Romans 8, that you believe this to be true. No one shall separate us from the love of God in Christ. Neither tribulation nor distress, persecution or famine, nakedness, danger or sword, because I recognize this prophecy written for your sake. The world hates us and we are being killed all the day long. They regard us not as people, but as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all this, we are more than conquerors because we are found to be in Christ. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, angels nor rulers, things present or things to come, powers, height, depth, or anything in all creation, nothing will separate me from the love of God which is mine in Christ Jesus, my Lord. That's what's recorded for you with the breaking of the fifth seal. That's what's recorded for you in the breaking of the sixth seal. You are an overcomer simply by persevering in the faith, trusting in the Lord, and worship. Hard to believe this is the act of overcoming, but it is. The troubles of this world, you set aside and you recognize God is Lord and you praise him. And he says, you're an overcomer. It's an amazing blessing for us. And so let us be assured we will be not just vindicated as in the world will know we weren't the evil ones that they hated for being judgmental, narrow-minded, whatever else they may say about us. No, you're going to be vindicated in that your trust will be rewarded when the rest of the world perishes for having ignored the word of life you brought, you will be glorified. You will get to sit with Christ on his throne. You will sing his praises every tear wiped from your eyes. That's the promise of God. That is the blessing which is yours. Vindication, now and especially in the day of judgment. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
strengthen us for the task which lies ahead to be ordinary Christians and to believe your promises to be true and to forsake this world and to die to self and to live for your glory. We pray, O oh Lord, for the honor of your name that we may know our duties to pray for our persecutors and to bless the Lord God and to honor his name. All glory and praise to the heavenly King who sits on